Okay, hello. My name is Matt Kempf, and this is a presentation for IP Analytics Strategy and Decision Making course, Fall 2016. Professor Ostro, thank you again very much for allowing me to do this from home. It's very, very helpful. Well, this presentation is called Pharmaceutical Patents. The Orange Book and Regulatory Strategy for Pharmaceutical Patent Holders. Well, it does sound like quite a bit to take in, because it really it is. There's a lot of regulation surrounding pharmaceutical patents that we just don't see in our regular, everyday patents that we encounter all the time. Um, so I got to work on a little bit of this um, during my summer ex or internship last summer. Found it to be very, very interesting, so I thought this would be a great opportunity for me to explore that a bit and to see if there were um, any interesting statutes or just practices out there for strategy, decision making, revolving around this pharmaceutical industry. And it um, turns out there is quite a bit out there, and I just want to talk about some of that today. And hopefully, this will just be interesting for you as it is for me. So let's get into it. So at the beginning of the course, we read the Fisher's article when he uh, was talking about the different ways to use patents and the different strategies a patent holder could employ to, to protect the patent, to use it, to monetize it, to uh, get the most out of it that we possibly can. So as we can see here underneath uh, the ex exercise, the very first one, exercise market power, U.S. pharmaceuticals falls into that category. But uh, the more I got to thinking about it, is there are there other ways um, that, that we could strategize, that we could use these patents or use the the regulations and uh, to our advantage um, to put ourselves in a better position if we were one of these pharmaceutical patent holders. Okay, so this is the Orange Book, and uh, the actual name of it is the Approved Drug Products and Therapeutic Equivalents Evaluations. So this is probably just easier for everyone to call it the Orange Book. Um, yeah, so the perp this is the FDA's description of it here. This first bullet point identifies drug products approved on the basis of safety and effectiveness by the FDA under the Food Drug and uh, Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act. A uh, brand name manufacturer comes out with a drug. They are required uh, by statute to list all of the relevant patents that are associated with that drug into this book. It also lists uh, the dates where the patent, when the, the patent will expire, so generic manufacturers can come to this book. They can look and they can see, okay, I want to make a generic of this drug, and so these are the patents that are covered by it. And so, if we want to make this drug, we need to make sure not to infringe those patents, design around those patents, or plan our timeline around the expiration of those patents, etc. And I know that I'm. I'm grossly oversimplifying the process here. This is very, it's a very intricate and um, difficult <laughs> to understand process. And so I'm just trying to hit the, the highlights here so um, we have a basic understanding of how this works. So the, the brand name manufacturers will request, request the FDA to list their, their patents in this orange book. And the FDA doesn't do much investigation into it. They just sort of take the the, brand, the manufacturer at their word, saying, "Okay, you say that this drug is uh, covered by these patents. So, okay, good. We'll list them in this in this uh, the orange book." And the manufacturer can also request at some point later, if there's been some sort of mistake, or it turns out that this patent does not cover this drug, or there was some sort of issue you know with the patent office there needs to be some corrections made to the patent etc they can request the fda to delist that patent from the orange book all right so the process that a generic manufacturer has to go through in order to get their drug on the market they have to file an application with the fda it's called uh, an anda an abbreviated new drug application and so there's different types of andas and it's all dependent upon which part of the life of the patent that you're currently in and so the most controversy sort of uh, revolves around a paragraph four ANDA. So what's important about that is they will have to file this paragraph four as opposed to the other three uh, if they're asserting that the patent that the drug covers is invalid or that they're not going to infringe this patent by manufacturing that generic drug. And so the other ones, is, as you can see here, paragraph one, if the, the drug is not patented at all or they don't have any information on file about it being patented or the file paragraph two that the patent's already expired. So at any any time that a generic manufacturer wants to put any sort of drug 
they have to fill out one of these types of, of um, applications. So the ones we're really going to be dealing with here are paragraph four. So what's different about this is, um, you know, in other patents that we see, like there are only certain ways where you can be said to be infringing upon the patent, you know, make using, etc. all those things. What's different about the pharmaceutical industry, just filing this application itself is an act of infringement. And that makes it um, just something very interesting about the pharmaceutical patents. A generic manufacturer cannot even start to make the generic drug or get it on the market without filing this paragraph four certification. So it's sort of a forced infringement situation. So if this does happen, the paragraph four applicant has to notify the brand name manufacturer that they are filing this this certification. And the at that point, the manufacturer will have to bring suit, bring an infringement action against the generic within 45 days. And if they do so, the all the other generic manufacturers out there on the market who are wanting to bring this a uh, similar generic drug to the market, the FDA will not approve any other applications for that drug during this 30 month stay. So this is something good for the, the brand name manufacturers. This 30 month stay grants them a little bit more time, a little bit more market exclusivity. So if it goes to trial, if the generic wins, the sort of reward they get for being the first applicant the first paragraph four certification applicant, they get this 180 day market exclusivity. So as soon as they bring their drug to market, no other generic drugs can bring a similar generic drug onto the market during that period. But once that, that 180 days has expired, the FDA could then start approving all the other applications for generics for that type of drug. So this is pretty big incentive for generics to uh, take on the risk of litigation, go through this whole process so that they can hopefully get this 180 days exclusivity. So yes, that is one option. If uh, a, a brand name manufacturer is faced with one of these paragraph four certifications, they have the option of taking it to court, going through the litigation process and going through all of that. But there are also other alternatives, such as delisting the patent from the orange book. There's been a lot of uh, controversy surrounding this and uh, new rules that have, or new case law that's come out that sort of limits this, uh, this option. So really the effect of if, if the brand name manufacturer was able to delist this patent from the orange book, the paragraph four certification would then need to be converted into a paragraph one because if there's no patent there covering the drug, there's no way that a generic making this drug could infringe this um, imaginary patent so but the effect of that is it's only paragraph four applicants who get this 180 days exclusivity not paragraph one through three so the incentive for uh, filing these paragraph four and is in the first place sort of is removed if if a uh, brand name manufacturer is able to just uh, delist the patent after the generic has already started the process with a paragraph four and a so over the years, then the, the trial courts have looked at this and the circuit courts and have come to the conclusion that once a generic has already filed a paragraph four and a, a brand name manufacturer cannot then go and delist the patent from the orange book, forcing the generic to lose its 100 day exclusivity. So, but it is a good strategy if the ANDA has not been filed yet, but the uh, brand name manufacturer sort of anticipates that there's a good possibility somebody could be making a generic of this or they're about to if they have some way of knowing that um, it's a good strategy to go ahead and possibly delist that patent if it's not something that's that's necessary for the patent it's not it's not uh, closely related so but otherwise not recommended if the paragraph four and has already been filed there's also then the popular strategy of patent layering. So obviously every every drug when it's discovered and, and patented and made it's an original in its original formulation, it's the active ingredient, the manufacturer patents that and then continues testing after that and, and comes up with new secondary features and formulations and uses of that of that uh, the drug, which they would then go and patent those things. And as they're continuing to patent different things related to this drug, they'll they'll have to list those patents in the orange book as they, uh, they come about. And so 
The thing about that is, is the active ingredient. It was typically filed first, which will have the first expiration date. And then the later discoveries, as they are filed, will then have later and later expiration dates. So this sort of elongates or extends the brand name manufacturer's monopoly over this drug because the last patent that is covered by it may not expire until way into the future. And this is, has been in the past one way that the brand name manufacturers have been able to protect their market power. So and in 2003, Congress passed MMA, which um, sort of limited, it limited the protection for the brand name manufacturers. They can extend the monopoly after an active ingredient patent expires. So one strategy in the past has been that the, the brand name manufacturer would, after this paragraph four and has been filed, then they would add a new patent to the orange book that is supposedly covered by this drug. And then the generic manufacturer would have to, fi would have to amend its application or file a new paragraph four um, certification, which would again trigger another 30 month stay of competition from the at the FDA from approving more applications. So this was just a strategy where a company could continue to add new patents and get multiple 30 month stays one after the other. The MMA in 2003 eliminated that and stated that the brain man manufacturer could only get one 30 month stay per drug. So this is not really a viable strategy presently, but it is recommended that we continue to add those um, new patents as they come, but it's not going to make any difference after uh, paragraph four and has been filed. But it is smart to go ahead and keep layering those patents on there to, to get the expiration dates to keep pushing forward and forward. So the most viable, as we're getting towards the end of this here, is something called reverse payments, basically settlement. It's an agreement between a brand name manufacturer and a generic to the first filer of that, that paragraph four to delay their market entry. And the brand name manufacturer in the past would pay the generic and say, hey, we're gonna give you this big chunk of money if you agree not to bring your product to market until a specified date that they agree upon in their in their settlement. And this in the past has been, was is viewed by many as anti-competitive because it's, it's keeping other generic drugs off the market because the 180 day exclusivity does not trigger until the generic brings their uh, drug to market. So they can just sit on it for as long as they choose and as long as they they agree to based on their settlement with a brand name manufacturer. So, but it's also, it's been viewed as anti-competitive, prevents other generic companies from being awarded a paragraph four until the exclusivity period, the 180 days is complete. And so it requires the public in the long run to pay more while the generic is sitting on the drug and not bringing it to market. The consumer has to continue to pay higher prices for the drug. So some view that that is is not competitive it's it's anti-competitive it's not allowing other generics to get their their uh, product out there at a lower price for the customer for the consumer but in 2013 it was a ftc versus activist case the supreme court took on the question and they've ruled that the these type of agreements these reverse payments are not per se illegal as some circuits had held prior to that but they apply a rule of reason analysis to determine if these settlements are legal or not. So they look at all the circumstances surrounding the agreement. They look at the terms of the agreement to determine whether or not they're anti-competitive. And so something of note for the brand name manufacturers that in any of these types of settlements between a paragraph four and a applicant and the brand name manufacturer, they have to be reported to the antitrust agencies. So there has to be some caution there to ensure that these settlements are set up in a way that don't trigger the anti-competitive nature that many people are worried about here. So something that any patent holder has the right to do is to license their patent to third parties to make and use that, whatever it is that, that patent covers, and that's not any different for some pharmaceutical patents. So there's something called authorized generics. This is where a brand name could license a third party to market a generic version of its own drug, which is usually exactly identical in every way to the brand name drug. They just package it differently it looks different, but it's the exact same formulation. But they uh, license third party to, to make this drug and to sell it at a lower price. And of course, they get a percentage of the profit there. So that still continues their market exclu exclusivity. And so even if a generic drug goes through the paragraph four process, gets approved by the FDA, brings this generic drug to market, has 180 days of exclusivity, no other generics can enter the market 
via the paragraph four ANDA, still the uh, Brené manufacturer has this authorized generic on the market can, can, and can compete. And this has been shown to, to lower the amount of profits that the generics can make, even though they have this exclusivity. Some people have viewed this as, you know, it's anti-competitive, it's, it's um, staying their monopoly, all, all of these sort of things. But F as we see, there was an FTC study done it started around 2007, 2008, where um, they studied this to see sort of what the, the impact would be on generics if well, allowing uh, brand name manufacturers to have these authorized generics and compete in the marketplace. And they found that it's really not that competitive. It lowers prices for consumers. It's still good for the customers. They get to pay a lower price and it only marginally affects the generics long-term profit. So it uh, it does affect some in the in, during that 180 days, but in the long term, generics are still extremely profitable, and they hold a vast majority of the market share for pharmaceuticals. And so the FTC and the, the case law came in coming after that weren't very uh, weren't very sympathetic to the generics when it came to this because they are still making quite a bit of money. So this is uh, has become a really good bargaining tool for for the brand name manufacturers whenever they're going into these settlement negotiations they can say hey we agree to not make an authorized generic drug if you guys agree to not enter the market with your drug until a certain date so instead of paying the money directly which gave some courts a lot of issues and problems has become a really good bargaining tool that uh, pharmaceutical companies can use and it's been very very popular and very successful so on the uh, FDA website, they maintain a list, a comprehensive list of all of the authorized generics that are currently on the market. And they, they list, as you can see, sort of through my faded out picture there, the name of the drug, the dosage, strength, applicant's name, the, that's the, the maker of the drug, the date that that generic entered the market and when it's supposed to come off the market. And so they, they do their best to update this quite often. And so this is just sort of an idea of currently how many are out there and, and the list I checked yesterday uh, just over a thousand a thousand and two generic drugs currently on the market just as of September this year so quite a bit out there um, quite a bit of money being made from these and this is a, a really good option as as the patents are uh, coming towards the end of their life they're coming towards expiration this is a good option this allows the pharmaceutical companies to get a little bit more money, a little bit more market power from their drug um, before they have to see it expire and generics take it over. So the ideal strategy, so we looked at some different strategies, some different ways to go about this. And just given the the way it's evolved over time, it looks like that this, this negotiating and using authorized generics as bargaining power is really the best way to go. Definitely layering the active ingredient patents with those most um, closely related and relevant patents and trying to stay away from the types of patents that are not closely related as a very good strategy as just a bare minimum. Also delisting any un unrelated improperly listed patents in anticipation of future and is being filed. Just to be careful not to delist anything after a, a paragraph four and has already been filed. Also, yeah, so the use the ability of to market and authorize generic drugs where I talked about um, any exclusivity period as bargaining power for settlement of infringement claims. And when you are making these settlements, structure them in as to not restrain the generic from entering the market past the expiration of the patented issue. That sort of hints towards the anti-competitive nature of these agreements that people didn't like in the first place. But if you're um, allowing those generics to enter the market uh, before your patent expires, it's tough for plaintiff to prove that you are entering into an anti-competitive agreement here. So follow the guidance of the Supreme Court and the Actavis decision use a rule of reason analysis, and make sure that everything that's being agreed upon is not anti-competitive in nature, or at least try to structure it in the best way possible where it doesn't seem like the whole intent of this agreement is to keep other generics off the market. It's good to talk about just how uh, you're saving expenses from litigation, you're just trying to avoid all of that and just trying to, to come up with a deal that's most profitable for both parties. Um, that's been something that's been successful. Um, that's pretty much all I have. I know it's a very in-depth topic. There's so much so much involved and I just barely skimmed the surface. And I know this has already been a long um, presentation, so I apologize for that. Um, hopefully it wasn't too extremely boring, but um, please let me know if you have questions, comments. I'm My paper's gonna go into quite a bit more detail on all these things and hopefully um, come together with a nice recommendation for patent strategies uh, going forward. So thank you very much again for all of your help and for your understanding. All right. Thanks very much and have a great holiday season. Thanks. Bye-bye.